In this video, I'm going from an idea in my head to concept sketches, 3D modeling, and finally to a real production quality miniature fit for the tabletop. If that sounds interesting, stick around and peek behind the curtains on how it's made. But who am I? Well, I'm just some guy that really enjoys miniatures, T&D, and tabletop games in general. So much so that I've even started my own open license war game system called If Worlds Collide. I'm by no means a professional sculptor or designer, but we'll see what we can come up with just the same. In If Worlds Collide, one of the factions is the Crimson Castellan, and they are the subject matter for our design. Over the past few months, I've been working with a professional 3D artist to get some of the figures for the faction sculpted. However, there's one figure I wanted to make from scratch, the Castellan Builder. In my mind, these are the subservient thralls to their vampire lords, constructing totemic effigies on the battlefield. I'm picturing large, brutish ogres or giants that carry the bones of battles past in large packs on their back, and with a large hammer to use as a weapon or tool as the situation changes. Before we start sculpting anything, it helps to gather reference images, as well as some sketches of what I want the miniature to look like. This is actually a step I've gone through for all miniatures, including ones that I've outsourced. An artist can work from nebulous descriptions, but you might not get exactly what you intended back. In addition to individual bits, we also need to find a pose for the miniature. If you're familiar with Frank Frazetta's work in comics or fantasy illustration, he really conveys a lot of motion and character with his poses in his drawing. This sketch titled Day of Wrath really spoke to me in the casual nature of the man holding the severed head and the axe. So we're going to be using this silhouette while I'm thinking of the pose for our builder. With all these references handy, it's time to finally start modeling. Over the past few months, I've enjoyed physical sculpting with clay and epoxy putty. Something about the tactile feedback and perception of the shapes that makes it such an intuitive process. However, getting a model from the physical world into the digital world in this way is tricky, and you always lose something on the way. Luckily, there's a piece of software for the Oculus VR headset that gets us most of the way there. Adobe Medium is actually free to use if you own one of these headsets. I've only dabbled with sculpting things from scratch before, but if you really boil it down, there's a few stages we need to go through. This stage is when we want to put down the major forms and shapes of the model. Starting with the torso here, I push and pull the anatomy to get the right kind of look. I want this thing to be slightly more monstrous looking, so I'm going to go for a hunched over appearance right off the bat. I drop in some extra lumps of clay to represent the legs and arms, and also a stock lump for the head. I mirror over the legs and arms so we have a matching pair on the other side, and after pulling in my reference image, I start to align the lumps to the pose I wanted. I could have done the posing at the very end after all the detail work, which is what artists who work on game models or models that need to have different poses later on would do. But since we're going to be working on the single pose here, it makes sense to bake it in from the get-go, because it's likely going to influence how we lay on certain muscles, for example, or other details. This whole phase is an iterative process, and I'm continuously moving around the main body parts until I get something that looks natural to me. I prop up some rocks and features under his left foot here and also dropped in a flat base so that I don't have him leaning in a way that I don't intend. Not having a ground plane can be a bit disorienting sometimes. This is where we take an in-depth look at each of the forms to add details. Starting with the basic musculature and using a reference to see where the main muscle groups are is key. I'm still a novice when it comes to proper anatomy, so every little bit of guidance helps. I think creature and monster sculptors have an easy out here, which is what I'm leaning on as well. You can exaggerate and purposefully get anatomy wrong under the guise of uh, creature sculpting since, hey, it's not a real human, it can look like whatever you want it to. For example, the, the pectoral muscles here are way over proportioned to the abdominals, but that's okay. Once I'm happy with all the new muscles, I start merging the layers together and blending them to simulate skin going over the top of the muscle groups. I have mostly focused on the arms, chest, and back up until now, so I spend a little time on the leg muscles too. Similar process as before, once I'm happy with the lumps, I blend them in together. Let's work a little on the face and see what we can come up with. Faces are probably one of the hardest things to get to look right, even if you're doing monsters. If you get something off, even by a little, it has a very big impact on the look of the whole model. I spent quite a bit of time on the head and it just didn't look right to me at this point. 
and there's nothing wrong with scrapping what you have and starting over. So let's attempt a more orcish looking face this time around. From reference images, orcs tend to have very large bottom sections of the face. The mouth and jawline seem to be very tall, with the nose and eyes being much higher up on the face. I extend the bottom jaw with a massive underbite, leaving room for the tusks. And you'll also notice that I've shrunk down the head in relation to the overall body too. I think this gives the upper torso a feeling of massiveness when compared to the head, making the creature look bigger. To get started on the hammer, I import some of the reference images I had gathered into Blender, and from here I'm able to roughly sketch out the overall shape of the hammer before importing it into Medium. Now in Medium, I'm able to scale and adjust it further to fit the miniature's pose correctly. I'll be leaving this in a separate layer so I can always tweak it further if needed. I take my time in adding additional details at this point as well, such as these articulating fingers grasping the weapon realistically. This builder has been nude for long enough now, so let's give him a modest loincloth type of deal. I like to keep the clothing and accessories as a different color, just to differentiate them easier from the main sculpt. I'm adding harness leather scraps across his chest now too, and the beginnings of a back harness. For this, I leaned on more inspiration images of primitive backpacks with external frames. I'm going to have his left hand holding some of the straps here as well, which makes the figure really belong with the backpack instead of it just being pasted onto the back. I think the hands and the face are the most expressive parts of a model, and you can tell a lot of story with them. For the harness, I bulk out more of the shapes and start adding in some skull and bone assets I've sculpted in the past. There's even an Easter egg in there from one of my patron sculptures too. See if you can find it, Frank. While sculpting, we've likely introduced a ton of artifacts into the model. Things like voids and internal geometry, needless overhangs and cavities, which will cause issues when printing. I'm bulking out some of that geometry with little blobs of clay so that I won't have any issues later on. I'm also taking the time to merge more of the geometry at this point, where I can. But some of the hard seams are fine to leave as separate because the slicing software usually does a pretty good job of merging the meshes for you when it spits out the slice model. The export that we get out of Medium is huge, over one gigabyte in size. That's because it's a voxel-based modeling program. It doesn't understand the level of detail, differences between flat surfaces and small details very well. Taking this into Blender and decimating it gives me the best of both worlds. Less faces on flat areas and lots of faces where it counts. I like to bring the face count to under 100,000, which gives us a file size of around 50 megabytes or less to work with. That's going to be plenty of detail for 3D printing figures of this size. I've gotten really used to slicing and supporting my models in Lychee Slicer, which is what I'm using to support the model for this project. My approach is a mix between automated and manual steps. I like to orient my models manually, making sure all the important details and the overall beauty angle of the model is facing upwards. This is going to minimize the amount of supports on that face and produce a cleaner look. I then hit the auto support algorithm built into Lychee, unchecking the auto orient button so that it uses the orientation I picked. I always go for light supports here, since I'm going to be going in and adding some extra supports manually. The ones at the bottom of the feet are the best candidate for heavy supports, followed by some around the waist and some medium supports further out. I'm also running the island detection algorithm here to catch any spots the initial support logic missed. You always end up getting 10 or so islands fixed up this way. Once we have the supported model, I'm going to slice this for the final printing on the printer provided slicer. Anycubic Photon Workshop, which is a great time to talk about our sponsor for the video. Anycubic sent me their new Photon Ultra D2 DLP printer for use in the project. This tech is slightly different from your regular MSLA printer, which uses an LCD screen to act as a mask between the UV lamp underneath and the vat holding the resin. On a DLP printer, there is no LCD screen. Instead, a projector beams UV pixels directly into the bottom of the vat, minimizing light bleed and achieving very good precision in the shape and intensity of light at each point. While it does have a lower overall XY resolution than 8K based LCD printers, it makes up for it in accuracy and precision of the projected image. With anti-aliasing and grayscale blur adjustments from the slicer, I was able to get some pretty sweet results out of this printer. 
Best part is the longevity of this machine is 10 times better than the LCD printer, and you don't have to deal with worrying about the screen being damaged or needing replacement since there is no LCD screen right under the vat. Check the link in the description to pick up your copy now. Now it's time to see the fruit of our labors. Before we can fully evaluate the model, I need to give it a good clean with isopropyl alcohol and another pass with a UV lamp to cure the model fully. Make sure to wear proper protection when handling uncured UV resin, as it will irritate your skin if it comes in contact. I've been post-curing my models with a handheld UV lamp lately. I've learned by feel when a model is cured at this point. You know it's good when spindly parts are just flexible enough, but it's different than when they come out of the printer. This procedure gives me the best chance that they won't break later on when I drop the model on the floor. I give it a quick airbrush prime at this point in black and white xenothal from above to fully contrast all the details. This print came out pretty good, and I do see some small things that could be improved in the final model, but this is a pretty fantastic miniature. Probably the best sculpt I've ever done. If you want to pick up this model, as well as the first release of the Crimson Castle and figures for If Worlds Collide, you can grab them on my Patreon, or find the link to my mini factory in the description. One note, if you do choose to join my Patreon, my $5 tier gives you access to all the 3D models I've ever made, including these. But I've got a limited number of spots at that tier, so grab it while you can. I think that's a pretty good value, especially since you get a ton of terrain SDLs, a base pack, and a lot more behind the scenes updates for my videos to boot. Thanks so much for watching this far and I hope to see you on the next one.